What's going on, everyone? Here we are, live again, Thursday night, April 25th, 2021, and, uh, oh, better, 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 no more lighting, more lighting, there we go, that's better, so what's happening, everything going well, it is the 25th of March, March is flying by already, actually 2021 seems to be moving along quickly we passed the one year mark of the pandemic two weeks ago and now we're just going faster faster and faster so i don't know i don't know what's going on there. what's going on so what's been happening how's your week been week's been good my week has been pretty good we have been uh had nice weather so far it's a little bit of some rain yesterday but today's pretty good you know not too bad can't complain where's my mouse here Oh, what's up, Rusty? Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Yes, well, you know, I, I recently got this thing called the Roadcaster Pro. And what that is, is a kind of a mixer. It's a, it's a mixer designed for podcasting by a company called Rode out of Australia. And basically, it's a multi-channel mixer for audio microphone channels. And then it also has a return loop from USB for the computer. So it also works as an as a audio interface for the computer. It does have inputs for what they call TRRS. So if you wanted to plug your phone into it, you could. Or if you wanted to connect your, <coughs> your phone via Bluetooth, you could do that as well. And then it also has a bunch of effects, you know, so things like that. But it hopefully it sounds pretty good. I've been working with it for the last... I got it, what... Um, two weekends ago and yeah so far so good last week was the first time we had it and uh this week we're still using it i've been recording some things for some of the youtube videos on it but it's it's working pretty well it also has um onboard effects uh there's on what they call the oral exciter and um a big bottom so it does some tuning of vocal tuning for the microphones and you can assign different uh, parameters for each of the four channels so actually you should tell uh tell your sister she needs to get one of these for their their podcast i think that would really help 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 what's going on tony nice nature music yeah yeah you know i'm trying to figure i like this is this is the the music that came that is what came on board uh, factory and so I still have to learn. There's so much to learn. It's got so much depth to it. Like, I ended up buying all this tech the last couple of weeks, and so there's just so much to delve into and so little time. So th there are multiple layers that you can use on this thing, and so it's really quite capable. I just got to figure it all out because there's actually a whole music library to choose from, uh, from other sources, not necessarily from Rode. But anyway, so thanks for tuning in. hope things have been going well. Wonder where are you guys at? Drop that in the comments. Where are you smoking and what are you smoking? What are you drinking too? So as always, coffee and cigars on Thursday night. We're going to start off with this coffee. This is the Corazon de Jesus, the Finca El Salitre, lot number 25. And it's made by a guy named Johnny Alvarado. And this is a really interesting place. It's grown in a place called... Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> now I can't remember. Chiripo. Chiripo which is, it's in the mountains in uh, Costa Rica. It's actually pretty far from San Jose. So if you're in San Jose, you have to like drive five hours to get there. And this one is at 22,500 meters, which is the highest um, coffee that we source. And it's really a lovely, lovely coffee. We actually do a lighter roast to it to really bring out some of the, the nice tropical notes that are in the coffee. And this picture here on the bag like a lot of our custom printed bags, they are, and this is actually him. This is actually Johnny Alvarado here. He's amongst his trees in the top of the mountains with all of the fog coming in. It was really a lovely, a lovely scene. But yeah, so we're gonna get into that. So Tony's smoking the Trinidad Lancero blend number two with the Diet Dr. Dr. Cherry, the Diet Cherry Pepsi. Oh, you're back home in your lounge. No, uh, Nothing at the uh, Faders North uh, Lounge tonight. 
All right, so let's move into it. We've got our brewer. So we've got a little bit of a different brew. This is what's called the Yama pour-over brewer, and it's, oh, it's a little bit taller for here. Okay, so you can kind of see that better. So this one's really an interesting brewer. It's one that I've had for quite a while that I actually don't really use very often. I just pulled this out of Hamden the other day because it's been on display there. But Yama is a company out of Taiwan that makes coffee brewing equipment that's really qu quite nice. And, and the interesting thing is that they do certain equipment that's based off of some, well, like for example, we have these brew towers and these brew towers are really nice, but they're very, you know, they're about $600 for the towers. And while that does sound like a lot, the ones that are made by a Japanese company called Oji, which have a lot of brass, a lot of like a different style of wood, really modern looking, really nice glass. And um, those are like $3,000. So the price, so Yama kind of makes nice coffee equipment at reasonable prices. So, like when I was getting those towers that, that we have at Hamden, like when I was first going to buy them, I would, they were like 2500 for the OGs. And I was planning to buy one one year, and I went down to the, uh, to the trade show, and I was like ready to go. And then I ran into a dealer selling the Yamas for like 600 bucks. And I was like, six for, so for the price of one OG, I can get three? All right, I bought the three. I hate to say it, but, you know. I'll uh, probably went, oh, you didn't work today. Okay, got, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Oh, excellent. Rusty has his Kung Pao Toro ready to smoke, but going to have it tomorrow. Okay, all right, very good, very good. One day we're going to get you to smoke uh, on time with us. <laughs> all right, so let's get into this. So the Yama, it's, it's interesting. It's got this, it's a, a glass chamber here on top, right? So this glass chamber has a valve that you can close. Now, you can leave it open and allow it to flow through like a pour over, or you can close it and trap the coffee as though it was a French press. And that's what we're gonna do today. It comes with this metal stainless steel mesh filter. It works pretty decently, I think. So we're gonna put that in. Or, well, we're gonna, we have our coffee pre-ground. Again, we're gonna do 12 ounces and, uh, of drink of coffee, and we're going to make um, 24 grams you can see the coffee here is somewhat coarsely ground. It's relatively coarse. We're going to put that as such in here. Drop that into our glass top. Oh. And you know what I forgot? I forgot to grab the timer. So I'm going to grab the timer now. I'm going to use the timer on the phone because that's going to be a little bit easier and I won't have to step away. Alright, so let's... Okay, we're gonna... Oh! We're gonna start our timer. If we can. Oh, whatever. We'll start it now. So I added it quickly to bring the water level, because as you can see here, it's not quite all the way to the bottom, right? So we just want to saturate the, the grounds for the first, um, I don't know, 20 seconds or so. And then we're going to fill it up and just let it steep. Okay, we're about 23. Okay, so let's go now. And I'm just going around to make sure that it all gets wet. All right, good. Now we're going to let it steep and do its thing. So we're going to let it steep for about three minutes, and that, I think, will give us the right amount of extraction for the coffee. And, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Tony says, damn it, Rusty, get with the program. Yeah, you need to be smoking with us, smoking with us. And, of course, he wants to know where in PA. So that's in uh, by nearby, nearby uh, Shrewsbury, up just north of Baltimore. And then Dai's asking, is there a trick to cleaning metal filters without making a mess? Well, I mean, um, 
depends what you mean by a mess. Like, I just kind of, well, I didn't think about how I'm going to do this today. But usually I'm by a sink, so I just kind of dump it out. But, um, yeah, you just lift it out and then kind of grab, use something to grab onto the bottom and hopefully it doesn't run away from you. By the way, Di, you're still in Florida this week or are you back? And then Inting's phoning in from uh, back in Jersey. Nice. I'm glad you like Coffee Brewer. Nice. Nice. Oh, so let's have a look at the... Uh, you can kind of see the level, right? But I'll, I'll put a light on it so you can see. So it's not quite reaches all the way down, which is... That's fine. You know, it, it, it'll it be... All right. Do we have anything? Can we see? I think, uh, that's good. Yeah. So that's... It's brewing. We're now two minutes, 13 seconds into it. Ooh, two to three more weeks. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Oh, I see. So I use a dishwasher tablet so my... St oh, I see. So if, if, if you're asking about like that, like cleaning this, like after residue has built up... Um, Gotcha, gotcha. That's the case. What I do is, uh, they you could use the dishwasher tablets like Tony's talking about, um, or you can buy this special thing called Kafiza, C A F I Z A, which is made for coffee equipment. However, I just use, me personally, I use OxyClean, OxyClean unscented. What happened? It, well, I mean, why I'm using that? Oh, it's three minutes. So now we're going to we're going to open this valve, right? So three minutes have, have ended. And now we're just going to let the coffee flow through. Huh? Let me lift it up so we can see better. You can hear it. So now it's going to flow through. The idea is that we, we, if we start the draining at three minutes, it should give a minute for it to fall. So we'd still get our extraction time of four minutes. So right now we're at 340. And it's rapidly falling, rapidly falling. Ooh, look at that. It's rapidly falling. Ah, huh? 351. Not bad. Quite professional. Like a boss. And this one, you could actually put more coffee, I think. You could put more coffee, but you couldn't put more water. You'd have to pour the water. In, like instead of doing a full steep like this one there's a marking here two three four um, I don't this is about this is about 12 ounces now so over two so probably it's maybe maybe it's rated for eight ounce cups no 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 we not right two maybe for six ounce cups right something like that anyway whatever I'm, math is not gonna be our strong suit today all right so now that we're done we will take this out of the way. So you can get this online. They're not cheap, unfortunately. They're like about 120 bucks, but they're kind of cool, right? Um, if you would like to get one, I do have a link in the show notes tonight that'll take you to Amazon. And the one that I've linked it to is actually a black based with silver instead of the brass and uh, wood tone. But they will operate the same. Yeah, so like I was saying, the... Um, if, we're, if it was, if you're talking about cleaning the stainless from the oils, residuation, the residual buildup, it's I use OxyClean, and the reason I use OxyClean is because I did a, I did some research into it several years ago, where I was looking at the components of the different coffee cleaners that are branded and made for coffee industry. And I was looking at OxyClean because they, when I noticed the, um, the ingredient list, they were very similar. And so I was unable to... F so there's a major ingredient that they're using in these coffee ones. And then there's, a, of course, a major ingredient in OxyClean. And I've, you know, it's been a number of years, so I really don't remember all the details and the exact name of the, the chemical. But from what I was able to research online, there really was no difference or there was very little difference. So we've been using OxyClean at the shops for pretty much everything and it's an oxygen based um, cleaner so it works pretty darn well so Rusty's saying yeah yeah don't smoke inside so 
we need to get you to build a, a new house that has a smoking room because pretty much everyone has smoking rooms now. It's kind of like what's going on in the world. And Tony likes to brew tire. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, it's a pretty one. It's a pretty one. All right, so let's get into the coffee. Oh, wrong glass. It's a, I guess from your, I mean, your perspective looks, looks pretty good, but from my perspective, I, since the light, since the lights are shining through it, it looks relatively light, but it's, like I said, this is one of the lighter coffees that we, we roast, and because of it, it, because it has more of the tropical notes and really kind of high acidity, we, I really kind of kept the roasting low, or low meaning like a light to accentuate that, and I think this one really is beautiful. This has actually been one of my staff's favorite for a long time now. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Crisp, slightly tart, just a little bit of nice citrusy flowing through it. Like, more like a, right now it's more like grapefruit. But not pungent. Like, sometimes you get these, these like, light coffees that are really sour and, like, punchy. It's not like that. It's much more smooth, a little more mellow. More my speed, more my speed. You know what I'm saying. You guys know what I'm saying. All right. So anyway, we're we're moving along, and um, oh, don't forget, we're still putting together the the tasting for the Agonorsa. So we're going to do the Agonorsa Rare Leaf Ex Reserve with the two Viso Cigarillo thingies with uh, Michael King. That's going to be towards the end of April. I still haven't finalize the dates of Michael. I've been a little bit lagging on that. My apologies. But we will have that soon. And of course, Raul has the pack. He's taking the orders now, so you can put that together. I'm going to be touching with Basin tomorrow because I'm going to be down his way since I'm getting my second dose of the vaccine. Maybe Moderna. Maybe Pfizer. Who knows? Maybe they'll give me Johnson & Johnson. And I'll get, you know, extra strength. But anyway, we're back again. Raul has the cigars for tonight. We're, and as you already know, we're doing the Punch Kung Pao Toro. This one. And it's kind of interesting. Like, he, it, the interesting thing is that I was reading about it, and, you know, since, like, 2012, when Davidoff first came out with their Year of the Snake cigar, which was actually really good. And actually, uh, the Davidoff ones that I've had, and I haven't had them all. I've had a few of them. The Year of the Snake. I think I had the Pig. Well, I don't remember which ones I had, but I think I had the year of the, the rooster. But anyway, the ones that I had were actually quite good. And a lot of these are, of course, especially for like Davidoff and the other companies, they're targeted for Chinese markets. So um, Habanos SA does, uh, does a release, and then, of course, Davidoff, Davidoff. And they're all quite pricey cigars. You know, they're pushing, you know, $25 and up for the cigar, and you know, a lot of that is because if they're focusing towards the Chinese market, you know, there's a the Chinese market's really open to luxury goods, and they're willing to pay quite a bit of money for practically any kind of luxury good that they can find. And a lot of that has to do with the culture there, where you may be buying exorbitant, like priced cigars. Let's say twenty five dollars, thirty dollars, and a box is, you know, of course, if there's what. $300 a box for a box of 10 or maybe 600 for a box of 20 I'm not really sure exactly how those are, are, are put together. But, you know, from our perspective, that seems quite a lot. And, and I, I think that's quite a lot. But in the Chinese culture, there's very... There, what, what is, a lot of that's being used for is for gift giving. So if you're going to give a gift to show respect to an elder, to a mentor to a boss or to someone in a higher authority you're going to give this and i learned this because i, I was you know as, I, as i'm out buying coffee and like i was at an auction in, in uh, colombia a few years back one of my friends who's a producer um juan pablo viota he owns he owns a place called uh, cafe san alberto in um Quindío in armenia <clears throat> and his farm won and it was like, I was involved in the auction, and I, I, I was bidding. But I was bidding when it was really low, like, you know, below $10 a pound. It got, I don't know, $50 and up. And, you know, you wonder, and you see these other coffees where they're, they're really doing a lot of 
they're really pushing the price high, like $100 plus. And as an American coffee buyer, there, I'm always wondering, like, well, what, how do you really do that? Like, how do you really move that coffee? So if I'm buying a coffee that's, I don't know, $30 a pound, I mean, I've got to sell that for quite a lot, either by the cup or by the pound. It's got to be quite a bit. And typically beyond what most American buyers are willing to spend, American consumers. Now, what these guys were telling me, so we were in Colombia, and I'm talking to these guys, and I'm like, well, how are they going to move this? And that's when they were like really explaining that. It's like, in the Chinese culture, you're going to be, these won't necessarily be sold, but they'll be given as gifts to people that they, have, they feel of importance and respect. So... Uh, you know, that's why, you know, these companies that are releasing all these cigars, so like Tony mentioned here, you know, Placencia released the Year of the Ox as well. Um, so there's Placencia, and uh, who else is doing it? Of course, we have Davidoff, Drew Estate, company called Great Wall, Habanos, Placencia, and then Tobacalera, SOU that makes Vega Fina. They're all releasing them, and a lot of them are really pricey. And the nice thing about this one is that it's really very reasonably priced. Like, it, the, the MSRP is five ninety nine for a, a cigar, and it's a 6 by 52 And I think that's a really reasonable price. Now, at Raul's with the Maryland OTP, it's six seventy one for this cigar. But that said, quite reasonable. And a part of that, I think, is, from what I'm reading, is that it's, oh, the punch is owned by General Cigar. And one of the problems that General has with a brand, with their brand, with many of their brands, including Punch, is that they only have distribution rights within the United States. Outside of the outside of the United States and the rest of the world, they don't have the copyright or the yeah, the, the copyright to use these brands. So, you know, those are all Havana brands from Havanos, and so they can't sell these cigars. So, you know, if they were just to you know make a really expensive cigar, you know, you couldn't sell it in China. So. I guess that's part of the reason why they make it and sell it in America and at American friendly prices, you know. So I think six dollars is quite a friendly price, and um, yeah, it's a pretty look. In, at least still in this wrapper, it's a pretty cigar. That I think, and then so oh, die smoking with dad. Tell your dad hello. How's it going? Thanks for tuning in. All right, so let's open this up a little bit. A little ASMR action. All right, so what we have is an open foot. Will it zoom in? Yeah, there we go. So as you can see, the wrapper only goes so far. The wrapper and binder only goes so far, leaving this this half inch of the filler tobacco just kind of there. I'm not sure if they actually trimmed that after they've they've rolled it. I mean, it would seem that that's how they would have to do it. Oh yeah, they must because if you look carefully, right? So I'm gonna hold this up and hopefully it'll zoom. In. Hold this the the focus. There we go. Now as I rotate it around, you'll see that it's not perfectly straight. It's not cut perfectly straight. There's a look at that little divot right there. So I'm guessing they must use the chavetta and just gently trim the wrapper binder off of it. And so following along with like Chinese tradition, they're using a band that has gold and red, which are the, the really symbols of good luck. And I, th what is it, they're packaged in eight? Yeah, so they're packaged in boxes of eight. And they come in these, like, metal tin, foil tin containers that are like Chinese takeout containers. Although I've never really been to a Chinese rest takeout place that had this style of container. I don't, I don't know where they got that. If they put it in those boxes, you know, the ones that unfold, that would be more. And the ones that I get locally, they're, like, in those black and clear plastic, translucent. But anyway, the... Um, these come packed in eight because of the eight is the lucky eight. You know, uh, in Chinese culture, eight is a big, um, how do you say, it? eight has a lot of cultural relevance. It is the lucky number. And, um, 
you know, it's got a, it's a, what is the eight symbol? Eight symbolizes strong intuition and insight. Someone that's going to explore the undiscovered. Also, very much of a business-minded kind of person. You know, so it, it, there's a lot of positive and important things to that that eight is 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 part of and general is trying to you know attach a lot of things to that so that's that's kind of nice you know that's kind of nice actually there's a part of me that thinks you know there's a part of me that was wondering about like um you know there's a part of me that thinks that that was thinking oh this is cultural appropriation but i was thinking recently about what uh that guy lim is it lim there's a chinese basketball player who I guess it's pretty tall. I, I don't really know basketball very well, so I, I'll have to forgive me on this. But evidently I was reading about this guy. He's a Chinese basketball player. He's got dreads. And one of the, the black African-American players came up to him and said something, or maybe tweeted about it. It's like, you know, about the, the dreads and how it's, uh, how it's you know, taking or, or taking cultural appropriation or something like that. And, you know, in most situations, you'd find people that were going to, like, battle it out, right, especially in social media. Well, this guy responded about about it, and he was like, you know, I, I grew up looking up to you, and like you're one of the my heroes in the game, and um, he was talking more. This is more about how this is more about cultural exchange. Like, I'm using this, and and then he was talking about how the guy, whoever was, you know, criticizing him, how he's using Chinese tattoos to send a message, you know, to. And, you know, I thought that was really an interesting thing. It, it, maybe it's more about cultural exchange rather than appropriation, right? Anyway, that may be a little bit deep. Jeremy Lin. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. Jeremy Lin. Thanks, Rusty. That's exactly who it was. <clears throat> and then Rusty's also saying that I have to get the same vaccine as the first. Well, why? This is America. I should have my freedoms and my right to choose whichever vaccine I want. That's what I'm going to tell them tomorrow. <laughs> and Inting says the same thing. Yeah, okay, I'll get it. All right, fine, fine. You guys have convinced me. I'll, I'll get the same one. And then, oh, so the Jeremy Lynn, Kenyon Martin. Yes, I just saw that. I don't remember the, the names, but I thought that was interesting. I thought that was, his response was, I thought, rather, rather well done. I don't know if I would have have, have been as as uh, thoughtful. All right, so let's move on. We've got our coffee. Still delicious. And uh, if you would like to get the coffee, of course, it's available on our website, spurrowcoffee.com. And uh, Ono Live for the checkout gives you 10% off of all things. So if you want to buy a coffee grinder, get 10% off. All right, so we're going to... Oh, I have to cut. Official cutting with the MTX cutter. And so we're going to use the cutter to cut the... Oh, oh, it's a little bit tight, a little bit tight. Feels like a little bit... Maybe it was a little bit on the drier side, but I keep it in the bags with the... Uh, with the, uh, what do you call it? With the Boveda. It's a little bit... But it's, it's tight. It's got a nice... What's well, got a nice tight? Oh, I didn't smell. Maybe there's a light barnyard, some leather. A bit light and a bit nondescript. There's some sweetness to it. Now, here's the speaking of sweetness. So, so Ed Laman, the, uh, the senior brand manager for Punch, was saying that this is a medium to full-bodied blend that has a vague sweetness with an undercurrent of spice which is supposed to be like the Kung Pao chicken. Now, they also spelled it Kung Pao, P-O-W, like Pao rather than Pao, as in, uh, I don't know what Pao means, actually. Uh, I'm mean, terrible to say that, but uh, I don't know why they did that. Maybe, uh, who knows? Who knows? Oh, and also, the this, this comes from a series of uh, year of the, um, the Chinese New Year releases that they've done for the last like, two years, and they would. They, the first one was an egg roll in 2019. The next one was a chop suey in 2020. And those were both. Um, the egg roll was more like a robusto at four and a half by fifty, and then the chop suey is like a 
a long like Lancero it was seven by thirty seven. And now this is a six by fifty six Toro. It's six by fifty two Toro. All right, so let's light. Now we're wondering like because is there some trickiness because of the exposed filler? Well we'll find out. It seems more difficult to get a, a really nice draw on it because of the, uh, maybe because of the exposed. Um, yeah, it's definitely. Definitely more difficult. So I'm going to go to the. We're going to abandon the. Uh, oh, everything's falling around here. We're going to abandon that and get to the Jetline 4000, the phaser, which will give us full power over this tobacco. Hmm, Tony saying maybe this is an homage to the movie Kung Pao. Enter the, f you know, I don't remember that movie. <laughs> but you're probably right. Hmm. All right, we're having a little bit of issue lighting it at the top there. I think we're lit. Well, relatively. I mean, it's burning. Yeah, let's see. You can see the uh, the foot. There we go. As you can see, it's a little bit uneven. But we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Ah, parody. Well, I figured, I figured that. I just haven't... I don't recall that. Well, I'll have to look it up later. All right, so it's starting out... Pleasant. Um, it doesn't really have a lot of like heavy flavors that I can that I'm saying you know, that jump that are jumping out yet. There's a little bit of a juiciness on the palate from it though. I'm wondering how it will change once we actually get into burning the wrapper. So we're still not into the wrapper yet. Right, just starting right there. Yeah, just starting at that one point. Right now there's a lot of brightness. Bright juiciness, kind of like, I hate to say it, but kind of like a Jolly Rancher apple. Which, in many respects, this brightness of the cigar should go well with the coffee. Oh yeah, that's quite nice together. All right, let's see how it go, how it progresses as we burn into the cigar. So, like I said, the um, it's uh, oh no, oh, it's become a cult film. Kung Pao Enter the Fist. That sounds like a great like uh, drive-in movie. So, like I said, this is a Kung Pao Toro, and it's a six by fifty-two. It's made in Honduras at the STG Esteli uh, Hatsa 
factory in Dunley, Honduras, which is uh, more like southwestern, south, southeastern Honduras, closer to the Nicaraguan border. So I think it's maybe two, three hours. Is that right? Two or three hours, maybe an hour or whatever. But it's um, from from the capital, Tegucigalpa. And so they made 4,500 boxes, which is up from 3,600 last year. So I guess they're doing pretty well with this line, which is about 90,000 cigars. It was just released on the 15th of February. And the interesting thing is that I was, as I was preparing for the show this week, I was looking for reviews, and since it's been released so recently, there's not really many written reviews out there. And as I was finally preparing to go live uh, a couple hours ago, I noticed that Half Wheel finally dropped theirs, which is good. It gives me someone to beat up on, um, someone to compare notes with. But part of me was hoping that we'd get it out before they got theirs. <laughs> I don't know why that's a thing. It's not really a thing, but it's a thing. Anyway, so Country of Origin is in Honduras, and it's using a Connecticut broadleaf wrapper from the United States. The filler, I mean, the binder is a Honduran Habano wrap binder. And then inside that, they've actually gone for five, is that right, five? No, four, I think four tobaccos from Honduras, Brazil, Dominican Republic, and Mexico. So when I read that, I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Like, that's a lot of, that seems like a, it seems like a lot of origins should make for an interesting play. Now, this is actually starting to get a little bit interesting. Now that we're getting into the wrapper, there's a bit of spiciness coming to it. It's, I hate to say it, but maybe like a Chinese five spice, some black pepper, some white pepper, actually, why not what black pepper? White pepper, that kind of bitiness from the white pepper. Mm, Chinese five spice, yeah, I don't know, maybe it is. Maybe. Maybe I'm just saying that because it's Kung Pao and I'm being like, you know, hypnotized. But it's, it's, now that we're, the, the uh, now that we're into the wrapper, that juiciness, that the juice is still there. The, the brightness is, well, the brightness is still there, but it's now being paired with that white pepper Five spice. Hmm. Not bad. Not bad. You know, and so this is nice because I mean, you're you're talking about it. right now. It's starting off nicely. Construction feels good. Like it's it's. Like last week's cigar was, you know, had that really nice oiliness to it. This one doesn't have that oil. It's, it's a drier feel on the on the fingers, but it's all very nicely done. Like it feels nicely constructed. It feels solid. You know, when you like right here at the end, you know, there's a good. Um, it's packed well, but it's not inhibiting the draw. So it's the kind of packing where you feel like you could, you could really bite down on it and like do your thing. Now let's compare this a little bit with Half Wheel. You know, we like to compare with Half Wheel. So their review just came out today. It was written by their, their guy, Charlie Minato. And Charlie writes that, um, you know, he they find interesting stuff, I have to say. Like, for example, they said medium plus with the aroma. They had notes of barnyard, dark chocolate, leather, earth. And then he had aromas of, like, industrial carpeting. Like installing, and I don't know what that smells like. I mean, I haven't really had new industrial carpeting in a long time, so. And then the foot had notes of uh, sweet milk chocolate, red pepper, white pepper, and still that carpet. I don't know about this carpet thing. Seems like a strange thing, but, oh, whatever. 
And the cold draw he had was a uh, milk chocolate blueberry earth generic tobacco. I don't really, I didn't really get that. You know, maybe some of that barnyard, like really light barnyard for me. Like I'm getting a nice amount of white pepper spice. Some of that brightness, that juiciness. I mean, that, that kind of like Jolly Roger apple. Now in their, in their cigars, he was getting earth, wet mud, sugar, sourdough bread, sugary sweetness, creaminess, minerals. Maybe the minerally, I can see that. That would be kind of similar to the, the juiciness that I'm getting. Earthiness, coffee, um, you get some black pepper. But I'm getting different notes. I don't know if that's just probably with it, will you interpret the palate. Now, I'm maybe going a little bit too fast because, as you can see here, the, uh, the burn is getting a little bit uneven. This is one of my problems, personally, is that I tend to smoke, especially with a cigar that I'm enjoying, I tend to smoke it, I start to smoke it pretty fast. I really need to stop doing that. I kind of want to tap it out a little bit to drop that, but I'm going to I'm going to try to let it rest for a few moments to maybe even out on the burn. Yeah. So what about you guys? What are you smoking? I know that I know Tony and is smoking, you know, some nice stuff there at home. Inti, what about you? How about you? What do you got going on there? Any beverages going on? I've been uh what did I do this past week? So I don't know if you guys saw that, but Zack Snyder's Justice League was released, and it's a four-hour marathon of epic proportion. Epic meaning that it's four hours. And I started watching it on, I watched it Friday, was it Friday or Saturday night? And I tell you what, the first hour, 25 minutes, the first 90 minutes, I was just kind of infuriated, just like mad. Because, and I, you know, I know that they had a release of uh, Justice League, in 2017. I read this later. And that was... So, basically, the whole premise, if you don't know about it, is... Zach... Jack... What's his name? Whatever. Oh, God, I can't remember his name. But this dude had made a number of the other DC movies. And I guess was, was pretty well regarded. Zack Snyder. Well, he had done a few movies. And he had shot... Justice League... And then, oh, his daughter passed away. I'm not sure exactly how or what happened. Or it was, was somehow his daughter passed away. So he needed to step back from the project. So the studio decided to bring in Joss Whedon. And Joss Whedon's like one of those, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer fame. And Joss came in and basically he did a bunch of reshoots. And he, you, he redid 90% of the movie. So what you saw in the theaters from before which a lot of people seem to hate, was Joss Whedon. And turns out that Joss Whedon just kind of a dick, you know? I mean, he's been, he's been like, you know, outed for being, like, extremely abusive to his, his team. And just creating a difficult work environment. And if you know anything about the motion picture business even under the best circumstances, it's a difficult environment to work in. So if you're, if you're a director that just makes it worse, then you need to go. Anyway, but forget it, that's neither here nor there. The, um, so he made this, evidently he had sort of, cut, I don't know if he had cut the movie or not back in 2016 or 2015, whenever it was, but they ended up going with Joss Whedon, they released it, and it was a bomb. Everyone hated it. So people had heard that Jack Snyder, uh, Zack Snyder had made this, this cut, and finally the, they got the studio to go along to release it, and probably they did the four hours, because, you know, people are home for COVID, and they figured, well, why not? Give, let them do the whole thing, and we're going to release it on streaming, so it doesn't really matter. We're not, we're not sending prints or anything like that out, so it's not really going to cost us as much. So they, they released it, and... You know, the first hour and a half... Okay, so, so a typical movie, you know, traditional movie running time is an hour and 20 minutes, right? 
So hour and a half. 90 minutes is a typical like Hollywood movie. Running time. So for the first so this movie is essentially almost three feature length films, more or less. So for the first feature length film, the first hour twenty five. They're giving a lot of backstory and a lot of the characters. Like, you know, so you get to see more about Wonder Woman, about Batman, about Flash, and you get to see more about Aquaman, where they're from, and these boxes that are, like, going to unleash, unleash the apocalypse, right? But, man, it's infuriating. I think it's infuriating. Like, if you're a Star Wars fan and you happen to love the original release, that was a series that was released in 1977, they were what they were. And then George Lucas at some point decided that he's going to re-release them and he's going to add all this additional footage. Well, if you ever saw that, like, he adds all this footage, but it does absolutely nothing for the story. It doesn't, who, who cares? Like, that's just, you're just wasting, like, another, you're just, you're just killing another half an hour of my life. And that's kind of what the first 90 minutes in Zack Snyder's is, is like. It's like all this extra visual presentation, but nothing to really, nothing to give you exposition and nothing to drive the narrative forward. So I just sat there like, and commenting onto Facebook, like, this is just making me angry. I, I don't know if you guys have seen it. And now, after the first 90 minutes, then we start to get to the story. And to be quite honest, I mean, the next three hours kind of flew by. It was really good, really enjoyable, I thought. And well-paced, good story, much better. I, I watched the original release of Justice League later, like the next day. And this one is far superior. Like, you know, there's so much, the, the characters are so much more interesting. Like, The Flash is interesting, not just some random dude that we don't really know anything about. And so by the and so what they do, what Zack Snyder does, is he breaks, breaks them up into chapters, where that just says chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, and then epilogue. And by the time you get to the, by the time I got to the epilogue, now it's like, I start at eight o'clock, so it's like 12, no, and I started at nine, it was like 1230. And there's a scene in the epilogue where they start talking about how basically they're going to have to continue. And it, it, I guess it's setting up for a sequel. And, you know, there's going to be another, like, a, a whole other event going to happen. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know what? I could go for another hour or two with this. <laughs> so it's, I think it's really quite good. Once you get past the first 90 minutes. So if you haven't watched it yet, my suggestion is to just kind of be ready with the fast forward button. So when it starts to like drag, just fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, move on. And I think then you really have a, you'll get to see, all, you'll get to like skip over the, the, the visually like, the visual parts and just go right and just watch the action. I don't know. If you guys have seen it, let me know what you think. I'd, I'd be interested to know. Oh, I dropped my, my ash. Darn it. Making a mess. This is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem with cigars. You drop them, the ash, onto yourself, onto your clothes, onto your desk, onto furniture, burns holes and everything. Terrible. So we're really rolling still. Maybe I'm going too fast. Am I going too fast? What's our time like? How much time are we running here? Oh, I guess we're all right. Ah, <sighs> oh, let's have more coffee. Yeah, that's quite nice. We're going to refill the coffee from our little Yama thing.
So if you got a moment and you enjoy the show, as always, hit the like button. Why do you hit the like? Why don't YouTubers say hit the like button? Because it helps tell YouTube that people are enjoying the video and then it'll recommend it to more people. And the more it recommends the video, then I can do more of them. Right? Uh, you know. So it's going along well. The, the cigar, it's not terribly, it's not terribly exciting. Like, there's not, like, fanfare and, and like, it's not punching. It's just nice. It's just, it's got good flavor. It's consistent flavor. Great construction. You know, it's one of those things where, like, you... So, a company like General, and I, I mentioned this last week because when we were smoking the um, the CAO, which is also from a gen, from General. You know, I said before last week that one of my concerns with these cigars from like General and similar companies that are much larger conglomerates is that they're just not going to be terribly exciting. They're not going to be very good. So this one's not like it's not the excitement and like flavor. And, man backo whatever you call it that does that like from like these guys right however what it is it's actually really like this is where this is kind of where you would where you want where, where this is kind of what I would expect from general from a big classic cigar company that solid construction and just generally a good cigar like it's not the best. It's not the most exciting. It's not the most anything, but it's solid. Right now, it's just solid. It's been solid the whole time. And I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it, especially at the price point. $6? Man. That's a good deal. And Rusty's saying, I went to look for my, I went to look at mine in the humidor because I didn't know that the foot of the cigar was not wrapped. Mine is almost as dark. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the, the filler is almost as, uh, as dark as wrapper. Well, that's nice. That's that's cool. Although, it makes you wonder, is, it, is that a... Could that be a quality, a quality thing? Or I, I would wonder, like... as So so if you're not familiar, the... Um, cigar rollers work in kind of teams. There's the bonchero, or bonchera. Or typically it's bonchero, because typically it's a guy that bunches the cigar. So he takes all of the fillers puts them together, puts a binder around them, then puts it in a mold and then presses it. And then the rollera, which is typically a woman, which is why rollera and bonchero, bonchero for male, rollera for female, or it could be rollero, right? And she's the one that after it's pressed, she'll take it, roll the 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 wrapper onto it and finish it. And typically, women are the ones that do the the final rolling because they tend to have the the most the best technique. Hey, you know, you know, guys, we're guys, so we're always like we're always like you know going too fast or something like that. We just don't have that finesse that women have, right? So Rusty's going to find out tomorrow. Good, we're going to find out tomorrow. But I would be interested to see, like, you know, be interested to know, like, if there was a really big difference between. If you're if you're noticing that the the color of the the, the fillers are the same color as the wrapper, and this one was obviously much lighter in shade, I wonder if there'd be a different experience. But I mean, this the draw is solid. The uh, amount of smoke that's being generated is really nice. I mean, it's really a solid cigar. Like, it's good. Like, you're not, it's not taking you on a crazy journey or, like, a wild journey or, like, some kind of exploration. It's just solidly rolling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that in itself is just kind of... Oh, we should do the uh, mail, mail bag. So we got the mail bag going on. So I got, a, I got a email or a, me a message the other day, the other week, last week, two weeks ago, from Skip Martin. Skip sends me a text, and he's like, just sends me, I wonder if I can find it. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but 
but he sends me a message from Managua, I mean from uh, Esteli, <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll do that, we'll definitely, now how do we share again, oh no. Do I remember how to do this? Uh-oh. I know I did this last week. This is the problem. I haven't really done anything over the last week. Now I can't remember. Oh, there it is. I guess you can see that, right? Yeah, you must be able to see that. This live. So this, so he sends me this, no comment, just this picture. Stacks of revenge. <laughs> it's like, God, really, thanks, man. It's like, thank you, I appreciate that. Anyway, so, because of that in mind, I called up uh, some people and they, they sent this box to me from Two Guys Cigars. I don't know if you know two guys. They're the guys that run the Cigar Authority. And I gotta say, this guy Dave, right? Dave Garofalo, this dude here. He's the owner. He's quite an interesting cat. Like he does a lot of. He's really good. He's really interesting. It's really interesting marketer. All right, all right. So we've got. Oh. Oh, anyway, that's why. New Revenge. All right, good. So I've got something to do tomorrow. And that was in this week's mailbag. Also, I ended up finding this deal. I don't know if you're really into this, but if you're into photography, this here is the Rokinon... Broken on 85 millimeter cinema lens with a T-stop range of 1.5. I got this used at Service Photo here in Baltimore, and they've got, you know, that's the interesting thing. Like, if you're looking for gear, this is why I like local shops. Like this place, they do used gear, and so you can find really nice deals for really cheap. Well, at least cheap compared to the the going price. I don't know if you can see here, like you can see it's got a, it's, it's a pretty nice sized glass and it's got good latitude. Yeah. Um, the imagery is really nice. So that's kind of what's been happening in my world. Have you guys got anything interesting going on this week? Evidently, March Madness is since full swing, and now we're in the Sweet 16. My understanding is that a lot of people had some upsets last week because Oral Roberts University won one of the games. I guess they weren't supposed to. I guess Oral Roberts is a good basketball team. I don't know. What else happened in the world? Five dead were, five were killed today in a tornado in Alabama. Alabama. Tornadoes. You just wouldn't think that. Hmm. Speaking of Alabama and the South, so I was talking to my cousin and his son, who's kind of my nephew, right? Went off to school to attend Mississippi State. Oh, finally going on spring break next Friday. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. So yeah, my nephew's, I guess he's in spring break. And, but basically he went off to Mississippi State last year in the fall. And so I see my cousin, and he's like, man, I was so pissed off. <laughs> I was like, what happened? So evidently, his son is going to Mississippi State, and now he's kind of a dude. Like, he's a jock, right? He's a jock. And he goes to Mississippi State, and he comes back, and his, his father's like giving, you know, they're, they're all joking, right? So I, I have to be honest, I didn't see that. But in Animal House, I think it's Animal House, there's a scene where they're joking with someone about getting a 0.0 
GPA. And so my cousin and his wife are, laugh, are joking about this with their son in the car over Christmas break, and he's like, and they're laughing. Of course, the son's really quiet. Like, he's not laughing. And it's like, well, what's going on? So it turns out that this kid spent all of last semester partying. Like, partying. He partied hard because he came home with a 0 0.78 GPA. Man, how do you do that? 0.78. Like, that's, there's not even a 1 there. There's a point. There's a 0 0.78. Like, that is just... Like, he just never, he just partied. Partied, you know, like, and he wanted to join the, the fraternity, and was like, he had a great time. The school came down on him, his father came down on him, they were all, like, mad and everything. And so he's like, he had to go back to school and take the grind, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It was really, really impressive, really. It was just kind of impressive. Like, I, I don't think in my worst, like, I think the worst I ever got was, like, a 2, maybe a 2.0 was was the worst in, the, in a semester. Maybe at that. Maybe I was at 2.5. I mean, you have to try really hard. Or maybe, not try, maybe you're not trying at all. Like, you, you can't... Like, are you even going to class at that point? Right? So, but the best part is that, you know, he's back at school now, back in Mississippi. And uh, he's back in Mississippi. Oh, oh and so... Is he, was he on he was he had a partial scholarship he did not lose it but he's like right on the verge like they're like if you don't get a 3.5 you're out and I was like and so worse than that he's he's like he's back at Christmas and he says to his dad he's like well does that mean you're not gonna pay for my my fraternity membership I was like <laughs> that's some balls man that's some balls Actually, it's probably something I would have done if, if I had happened to me. I'd probably say to my dad, "Dad, would you pay? You know, can I still have money for the fraternity?" So the father said no to the fraternity money, which I would have said too. But of course, you know, kids they go to their mom. The mom says yes, so the mom took care. Of it. So he's still part of the fraternity. But the the best part is that he's back at school now. He's working hard. He is working hard from what I hear. Calls his dad. He's like, "Dad, I need my social security number. I got a job." So you know, when you guys go to college, when you, when we were all in college, you're in college. And you get a job in college. What kind of job do you get? Like, what's a college job, right? Working at McDonald's. Working at someplace. The photo store, like Tony did, right? You know, you, you work in a regular job. So he's like, so my cousin, he's like, well, so what kind of job do you get? And he's thinking, oh, here we go. Growing up in an Asian household, if I brought home that, yeah, no doubt, man, no doubt, I would have got beat, beat. <laughs> I would have, you know, I was at school in Hawaii. I would have come, I would not have come home. I would just be like, I, I, I can't come home. Here's my, here's my report card. But the nice thing is that nowadays, like, they, they can, so my cousin says every, every Sunday they go online and they check his grades. So evidently at school now they update the grading every week. So as a parent, you can watch your kids' grades every week. So, they're really on him, which is great. But back to the job thing. So what job would be would a kid in, in college have? You say, Dad, I got a job serving food at the sorority. <laughs> oh, my God. What is this craziness? So he's got a job at the sorority house serving the girls their meals. You know, there's, there's a part of me that's like, that is just ridiculous. Like, disappointment, right? But there's the other side of it that's like, there's probably a level of brilliance there. Like, you, you, you just can't, I mean, that's, you're in the hen house now. You're right there. I don't know, that, that sounds like a... <laughs> it's See, it is. It's totally brilliant. I'm totally with you guys. What was that? I was like, oh my gosh. This kid, I can't believe him. I can't believe him. I have to shake his hand. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know. I, life would have been so different had I taken a job like that in college. Serving girls at the sorority house. 
<laughs> oh, God, this thing. Okay, here's a problem. Every time it gets long, it drops. Okay, that's irritating. Okay, so it just drops with a little bit of the... Uh, Did I have a job in college? No, did I have a job in college? Well, I ended up doing a little bit of stringer work for the Associated Press and for, and with uh, the Honolulu Star Bulletin, but I wouldn't say those were jobs. Those were just things that I took pictures for and they, let, they published it. No, I wouldn't say that I had a real job. My parents were the type that were like, we want you to focus on studies. And I wasn't very good at studies. I was terrible at that. Actually, the, the best was, I was, uh, I was, <laughs> although one semester, I did take 21 credits, right? I, I actually went to two, school, two different universities. I went to my school in Hawaii, my main school, which is a place called Hawaii Law College. And then I went to the University of Hawaii. I signed up for class. Actually, I signed up for the community college in the University of Hawaii system called Kapiolani Community College. And the reason I went there was because Kapiolani had the reputation of having the hottest girls in Hawaii. And I was like, well, I, I hear that. That's true. I got to go find out. So I took a bunch of classes there. I took a business class. And I took, hang on, maybe two more classes. Because I had a full load at my, at my main school. And then I took like one or two more classes at this school. Just to meet the girls. And I remember I met this one girl from Guam. She was actually Chamorro. And Chamorro is the... Uh, the native people of Guam. They look, she actually looked very Filipino, but really cute girl. And I remember after a few weeks of going to class and getting to know her, I was like, we were, her and I were hanging out by ourselves one day, and she's like, so why did you, she's like, I know you go to the other school, why did you come here? And I said to her, well, I came here to meet you. <laughs> oh, she was really great, she was really great, great, great person to go out with. Anyway, so Rusty saying, one year, I worked at HMV Record Store. Oh, that's a great place to work in the classical music. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you buy a lot of CDs when you work in a place like that. We had a Tower Records in Honolulu, and man, I was there way too much. Sometimes you just bought CDs, you don't know why. <coughs> like you were cool. I don't know. So the second, you know, like I said, there's... We're, we're, in, we're into the second third, right? And the punch is doing well. So comparatively to like Charlie Minotto and Half Wheel saying the nuttiness is building, black pepper, roasted corn, earthiness, mineral, mud. There's something called the, they call the vibrant terroir sensation. I don't know what that is. White pepper, black pepper. So for me, I don't get a lot of that. I still get that spiciness with the white pepper. There's still that nice like brightness, juiciness to it. Like, if I, like, sometimes I wonder, like, with what he's saying, like, maybe we just have different perceptions on our palate, which is always a, a, a very serious possibility. But sometimes I wonder if we have some of these, when you get really some of these descriptions, like, are, are they, you got to really hunt for them. Like, I would have to really sit down here and think about, like, oh, does it taste like potato chips? And Tony did the same thing at Kent Mill Records. I used to go to a place here in Baltimore. We had a place here called Record Theater over on Liberty Road, and that was pretty, that was a pretty crazy place to go to. Huh, gosh. But Kipman was good. All right, so we're getting to the point where I'm going to take off this band. And the interesting thing about these bands is that they're like a fortune on the back. The only bad taco is the one you didn't eat. Yeah, I guess that's a good fortune. They should have made it the only bad bow is the one that you didn't eat. All right, so we're still rolling. So coming along, not bad. Still looking good. Still in good condition.
Also, if you're a fan of um, Archer and Arista Development, the actress Julia Jessica Walter passed away at home in New York City this past week. Um, she was 80, to 80 years old. I was like, oh, man. Also, Biden had his first formal news conference today. I guess he hasn't had a real formal news conference since he started. And evidently what NPR said this morning on the drive-in to work was that he's the latest of all the presidents. Like, this is like, he waited till March. I don't know what he said. I didn't really listen that closely, but I just know that he's had his first one. Hmm. So what else is happening in the world? There is, I don't know if you notice this, but there is a, a eruption going on in uh, Iceland. This guy. This guy is naked on the mountain with the lava. So there's the lava. It's flowing. I don't know if it could, like, oh, look at this guy. What in the world is going on here? Oh my goodness, that's not safe for work. Time to go back, time to go back. Don't worry, I will not be doing any kind of naked by the volcano. Or maybe that'd be a great thing to do for a live stream one day. Maybe next time I go to Hawaii, we'll visit, uh, we'll visit Rusty's brother and brother-in-law and sister and mom and then go to the mountain, uh, go to the volcano and get naked and do the live stream from there. Hmm. Also in the news, Vincent van Gogh had a painting that had been in private collection for the last hundred some years, and it finally went to auction at Sotheby's. Sotheby's at um, not Sotheby's at uh, yeah, at Sotheby's. So here, here's the uh, where is it? So the the painting itself is called. Seen in Montmartre, made in 1887, and it sold for this past week for $19.1 million. And this has been a private collection, and so it's really been unseen by the public for, you know, the, in most pretty much the entire time. And it's about the Moulin de Galette, Moulin de Galette which is in uh, Montmartre. And Montmartre, it was, um, it was actually torn down in 1911 from what I was reading, and so... It's kind of a glimpse in the past. And like, you know, if you look at this, it's it's very like pastoral, right? And I don't know if you guys have been to Paris anytime recently, well, in our lifetime, but Montmartre is nothing like that today. I mean, it's, it's a fully bustling urban neighborhood that is just, you know, city. And so to see it with this, with this kind of like picturesque, kind of view is like wow like you just can't imagine it's the same city anymore right you know it's but if you ever go to Paris I mean it's really a cool neighborhood there's a great um, baguette shop there called um, it'll come to me it doesn't come to me right now I want to say Pongeron but Pongeron has been closed for a long time but it's right on the uh, right on the main street of Montmartre, and uh, really fantastic baguettes. And then you can also go to the Sacre Coeur, which is that basilica that's on the hill. It looks overlooks the city. It's like the most commanding view of the city in all of Paris. So it's it's worth going up there. And if you do happen to go to the Sacre Coeur, you can actually take a funiculaire to ride to the top instead of walking the whole way because it's really a, a brutal climb up many stairs. And also speaking of France, the EU today has announced that they're going to be reducing the, uh, they're going to be reducing the, uh, what do you call it? They're, they're reducing the shipments of, of the COVID vaccine to the United Kingdom because the UK, so AstraZeneca is like their major supplier for the vaccine. And so AstraZeneca has been 
manufacturing in both the UK and the UK and in um, the EU. And the UK has not, you know, the UK has been like vaccinating a lot of their people. They're doing pretty well with the vaccinations, but they're not sending anything out. So the EU now is getting mad because they've been, the EU companies have been sending to the UK, but the UK companies have been sending to the EU. So now they're mad and they're like, we're going to slow down your, uh, your shipments. So that's kind of the big thing that's happening. Still, rolling, still rolling. We're getting through the second, 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 third. And then, um, what else happening? Oh, the uh, the Suez Canal. Like, I don't know if you know about the Suez Canal, but the Suez Canal connects like the Mediterranean to the Arabian Gulf, right? That area of the world. And so, there's a a ship. One of the the the, the ships was blown ashore. You know, it, ground, it was grounded because of a, a sandstorm that happened. Now, this is a pretty major problem for worldwide shipping because 12% of the, the world's cargo passes through the Suez Canal. And so since, since that happened, now there's major, there's major bottlenecking happening. And like, I don't know if they can get the the ship to be pulled off the reef anytime soon, but um, but it's really kind of a problem. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I'm sure they're going to pull it off, but you know, I don't know if you knew this, but like, there's this guy on YouTube named Chef Chief Chief McCoy, and he's this Filipino guy, and he's a merchant marine, and in the merchant marine, there's actually a lot of Filipinos from the Philippines, and they. You have ships that are completely run by Filipino crews, even though they're flagged everywhere else in the world. Anyway, so he does this YouTube channel. It's really kind of fascinating, but he was talking about how, you know, transiting through the Suez Canal, and he was talking about the pricing. Like, these companies are paying something like $300,000 just to transit through the canal. But evidently, you know, it cost, it would cost, for them to go around the Cape, around, around Africa, it would cost them like another half a million dollars. And so it really is an important way of, of shortening the transit of, of ocean containers. And they're saying that because of this, you know, prices of goods may be increasing. They're going to raise the price of oil because of it. I mean, the oil's not here, but they're just going to raise the price anyway. Which never makes any sense to me. No one served South Korea is also reporting that North Korea today fired more ground-based ballistic missiles, flying them high. I, I, I don't know why. But I guess they're getting bored because of COVID. And so in, in today's news also, down in Atlanta, some guy goes into a Publix, you know, Publix, which is a grocery store chain there, goes into a Publix, goes into a public grocery store with a rifle and evidently is wearing like a, a vest and goes to the bathroom. Hides out in the bathroom. People are freaked out. They call the police. Police come down. They, 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 they found this guy. They arrest him. He's got like six guns with him. Like, what in the world are people thinking? Walk around with guns. Also, Prince Henry has finally got a job. He's now going to be working for a company in the Silicon Valley called um, Better Up as their chief impact officer. What chief impact officer means, I have no idea. But evidently, the, the company is about coaching and mental health services for their clients. I don't know who their clients are or anything about it, but that was big news. He's finally got a job. He's finally doing something. He's got to support his wife. And, you know, that's kind of got to suck. You've got this whole, you're a part of the royal family of the United Kingdom, and you've got all this incredible wealth and, like, opportunity and everything, and now you've given that all up, and now you have to go work. That kind of sucks. The things you do for love.
And now, what else is happening in the world? Oh, this past week was Paris Fashion Week. Let's have a look at that. That's kind of interesting, I think. So here it is, Paris Fashion Week, escapism hint. So we've got some, some clothes here to check out from the Paris Fashion Week. What do we have here? We've got Lowe, the Fall Winter Collection. Hmm, interesting. Oh, the Lowe show's been canceled. Well, what's going on there? Oh, I guess. Well, that's too bad. Oh, not bad. I like that. Oh, that's Balmain. That's that's definitely out there. Kind of like a Gautier kind of look, right? Oh, look at that. Balmain. Kind of reminds me of a Comme de Garçon, like Ray Kawakubo's kind of stuff. Oh, that's kind of classic. Chanel. Oh, Chanel's always very classic. Chloe. Oh, that's kind of cool. Who is this from? Is that Chloe? Oh, that's also Chloe. I like that. I kind of like that, that patchwork. Of, it looks like leather. Oh, there we go. Corrigé. That's kind of that's kind of classic looking. Oh, Corrigé also with a red. Like a jumpsuit, like the spaghetti strap jumpsuit. I don't know if I like that. that it looks a bit too... Maybe clockwork orangey. This is Mew Mew, winter collection. I think that's good. So you get that for the ugly sweater. There's your $2,000 ugly sweater. More Mew Mew. Looks like she's cold with that dress. Givenchy. Got, he looks pretty warm. <laughs> puff leather. Yeah, we're back to puff leather again. Givenchy again. This is, this is, this is, this is definitely club gear right there. That's club gear. Oh, that Dior, Christian Dior, not, that's actually kind of nice. That crepe, you know, kind of, fa that creping of the fabric there at the bottom. Mm, that's just pretty. That's just uh, something I could never afford. This is Coperni. Well, that's kind of, actually, that's kind of nice. I think I'd be afraid to date a girl that dressed like that because I don't think I could afford her. Coperni again. Not bad. Rick Owens. This looks like something Grace Jones would wear. Rick Owens again. I don't know what that is. That's, that's hot couture right there. That's truly hot couture. Again, more Grace Jones looking kind of outfit. Scaparelli, very Lady Gaga-ish. Tom Brown, looking very, I don't know, is that gothic? I don't know what that is. Oh, more Tom Brown. Tom Brown's really kind of out there. I dig the bag, though. The top hat's kind of interesting. Victoria Tomas. This very it reminds me of kind of like the unconstructed look of the 80s, you know, the kind of stuff that, um, that uh, what's his name from the Talking Heads would wear. Louis Vuitton. I like the jacket. I kind of dig the jacket. The sweater's kind of cool. Although those boots, I don't know, those, are, those, are those boots or are they uh, like chaps? Not chaps, but um, spats. They're like a spats kind of thing. Giovanni Giannoni. That's kind of interesting. Marine Serre. This looks straight out of... Uh, what's that store at the mall? Not Spencer. Hot Topic. This looks very Hot Topic. Like, here's where you spend thousands of dollars to get Hot Topic-looking clothing. This is Arnel de la Gente. That's kind of cool. I dig that. Like, yeah, I totally see a jazz guy playing with that kind of outfit. Hermes. Hermes, Hermes always got nice, classic-y looking kind of stuff. Hermes never seems... Oh, like, that's kind of nice. I dig that. 
I dig that. I dig that. I think the top is quite sheer, right? The the rib top that she's wearing underneath the jacket. The jacket's kind of awesome. Actually, the you know the, the interesting thing these the the skirt, the leather skirt. It's not the same, but there's something about it that kind of reminds me of how Azadine Alaya in the '80s used to make leather drape like fabric. I thought that was really. I thought Azadine. Oh, this is kind of interesting. Kenneth Eze. That's kind of cool. I dig that. Ken V's again, very much on the African sensibility. I think he's Kenyan, if I remember correctly. Or Nigerian, I think he's Nigerian. This is um, a Japanese brand called Under Undercover. So basically it says, printed larger than life replicas of oil painting by Swedish artist Marcus Akesson. Now this is the kind of thing that I would, that would that I would have seen like in an art school back in the 80s where people would take jackets and paint them. So, I mean, I don't know if I'd be happy paying thousands of dollars for that. Cecile Bonson, that's kind of, in, I kind of dig that. Kind of got that little house on the prairie sort of look to it. Okay, we're back to low. Okay, we're going to get rid of that now. All right, that's good, that's good. The latest in fashion. So you get it all here. Coffee, cigars, fashion. Hmm. Another thing that I thought was really interesting, there's a photographer back in the 1840s. His name is um, Henry Fox Talbot. And evidently, if Henry Fox Talbot had a had an auction, they, they found some of his earliest images, and they had an auction for them recently. Where was the auction? Also at Sotheby's. Guys, Sotheby's is like all over the news this week, and I thought that was kind of interesting to see. I'll show you that as well. So here he is. This is uh, Henry Fox Talbot with his uh, valet and assistant Nicholas Heinemann. Oh, that's his. That's his, the, his assistant's on the left. The under the guy in the middle is unidentified. But you know, they, they were saying that these were interesting glimpses into life in the 1840s. Westminster Abbey. So back then, you know, I mean, the photography was really, really new. Like, so it's it's really impressive to see these old images still around. This is writer and poet Thomas Moore in the center with a top hat. I guess that's his family. This is the passenger ship SS Great Britain in the city of Bristol. This is Lacock Abbey, his uh, family home in Wiltshire. I mean, can you imagine growing up at a place like this? What is that like? Which, which explains, if we, let's go back to him. So he's got this, this abbey. And, you know, photography back then was really something truly, like, cutting edge. So it really shows that you, even in those days, in order to have, like, the highest technology, you had to be part of the landed gentry. Oriel College in Oxford. And this is Talbot's sister, Henrietta Horatia Maria Geisford, playing the harp. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. So we're into the last third, and it's still pretty... The flavor hasn't changed much at all. Now, you know, Charlie Minato in his review in Half Wheel was talking about how there's a earthiness to it, and I think there's definitely earthiness to it. It still has that nice um, brightness to it. However, that brightness has kind of diminished, right? It's been replaced more by this earthiness, in my, in my opinion. White pepper still very present. Now, Charlie also notes that he has this herbaceousness to the to the flavor that he describes as a mild shishito pepper. And I thought that was really an interesting notation to make because shishito pepper is really, that's a really specific kind of reference. Like, I don't know if you've ever had shishito peppers. They're, they are quite, they can, they can have a nice bite, spicy bite to them, but they're overall pretty mild, really kind of tasty, flavorful pepper to eat. Like one of the bar foods, my, my cousin served this at his bar in Manila, is shishito peppers that are lightly battered than deep fried, and you eat that like as a bar snack. That's really quite enjoyable, actually. 
So speaking of uh, half wheel, let's look at. We always talk about the scoring, and I thought his scoring on this was kind of interesting. Let's let me look it up here. So for this cigar, he gives it an eighty-nine, and let's have a look at his at his saying. So eighty-nine. Oh, I can zoom in. Oh, I like that. All right, so, you know, 89, that's a pretty decent score. And he says, underneath all the gimmicks, the Kung Punch Kung Pao is about as solid a cigar as one can be. It's not the most complex, not the most interesting, not the best, but there's nothing wrong with it and a lot to like. Construction is most impressive, technically flawless in that regard. Wish there was a bit more sweetness to contrast some of the other flavors. Out of the three, so, you know, his favorite, this is his favorite. Now, here's the interesting thing, like... So Tony says, it's just pretension screwed enough to know that most... But, you know, I, I think that as... I, I know we're really... It's really easy for us to, like... We're really, like... It's really easy for us to, like, you know, poo-poo on, like, these kind of reviews. But I must say, you know, I... You know, Charlie... Charlie, Min, he's Minato. His last name is Minato. So he's actually... Um, I believe he's half Japanese. Minato's a Japanese last name. And I've met Charlie, and he looks very... Half American, half Japanese. I, I'm not really sure if that really, if that's really his, 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 what he's comprised of. But you know, he's someone that would, you know, if he's Jap he, since he is Japanese, he would have had shishito peppers. And I think that's really, to me, that's really kind of an interesting reference. I don't really necessarily think that's a bad thing. Although I know we, we like to to bash on, on them for those kind of things. But here's the thing: what I'm saying, what I'm thinking about is the. Oops. How do I move that? Can I move this? Oh, there we go. So, oh, This thing is so bizarre sometimes. The reason that it's disappearing is because it's like... I have two screens. So what you're seeing is actually... There was two screens. Oh, now it's the one screen. Okay, this is very strange. Okay, anyway, but... The... You know, eighty nine is a is a good is a pretty solid score. Like he says, it's it's good. It's not great. I think this is probably to me to me personally. I think this eighty nine is actually one of the more honest scores that I've seen in a, in, a, in a while. Like it's it's a good score. It's a solid score, but it's not like this is awesome. This is fantastic, right? Like when you get to the nineties, that's like really something that's like awesome. Should be something. This is, I don't know, I just think it's a very appropriate score. Like, it's a, this cigar is smoking really, really well. It's not great. It's not like the most mind-blowing cigar. But I think it's pretty good. We need to go back to the... Con <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it, you know, is... I mean, that's one, I mean, that's one aspect of it. I think we need to look at a at the overall, and you know, maybe maybe you could say that, that it should be lower, like an 87 or something like that, and, and I could and I can go along with that. But I, I think that if he was to say that it was 90, it would be overblown. I think if it was to say 85, it would be too penalizing. So I think that, I think that this 89 is actually a, a good place to be. I mean, maybe I would be closer to 87. 87, 80. I'd be hesitant to give it 89. It's, it's a solid cigar. Enjoyable. Nice flavor. Interesting flavors. That that whole part, for me, the the, the juiciness and the white peppery and then maybe a little bit of the uh, the five spice early on, I, I think is, is, is interesting. Well, and at $6... Man, I think you're, I think we're hard pressed to find as an enjoyable cigar at the six dollar price point than this has been so far tonight. I think your mileage may vary, of course, but that's my thought. But the problem with this thing is that I have only once tonight been able to actually ash into the ashtray. It's always falling off, and this wasn't very long. Look at this thing. Oh, it doesn't hold up. Ah, now I made a mess. Good Lord. 
So that's the one, okay, I'd say that's the one downside of this cigar, is that it, it will readily, once you've gotten a little bit of length on the ash, it's readily falling off. Like, it's, it just wants to fall. So it's going, unless you're, unless you're tapping quite regularly, it's going to make a mess on you. So that's, that's a downside. But it's using four tobaccos for the filler. So a total of six tobaccos with the binder and wrapper. And I'm actually cu- This is where, like, as a, as a cigar enthusiast, where I, would, where I think it's really... Where I think it would be much more enjoyable if they would tell us more about it. Like, you've got all these tobaccos in the world. You're a general cigar. You've got ostensibly the greatest power of selection of tobacco in the industry. Because you're not Cuba tobacco, you're not Habanos, you're not limited to just really staying within Cuban tobaccos, but now you've got the world to choose tobacco from, and you're choosing four for your filler. I'd be interested to know which cigar tobaccos did you use, and why. Like I think that would be really, really interesting as an enthusiast to learn. And I think that would be really something that I think would enhance the enjoyment and appreciation of the cigar more. Like, why did you use those tobaccos? Like, what were the properties of those tobaccos that made you use so many, so many different origins? Right now, we're going to hear a little bit more bitterness and a little more heat is starting to be generated. And so, Rusty, as Rusty always asks, would I buy it again? I think yes. I think it's $6. This is an enjoyable cigar. It's not the powerhouse experience that some cigars are. Like, for, as you guys already know, for me, the powerhouse of enjoyment is the revenge, right? It's this one. Like this, I, I just love to smoke them, you know. I, I, but I think this would be a great, like I would like to have this again. I would have this again, like say for example, let's say I started out with this as a first cigar of the evening and then moved into the revenge. That would be a nice build up. You've got this nice, you know, very pleasant, enjoyable overall cigar to start with and then you move to something heavier. I think that would be a good, good experience. But Rusty, I'd be here interested to know what you think about after you smoke it tomorrow. Mm. So how'd that Trinidad Lancero turn out for you, Tony? And also, what do you guys think about cigars for the future? What should I be seeking out? I will be hitting Raul's tomorrow after my vaccine, so I have the chance to look for other cigars for the for the upcoming smokes. And then, so next week is April first, and I haven't picked a cigar for that. That's actually a. a I'm gonna. I think we're gonna do something off book for that one. And then we're going to be moving into a series of cigars that I think will be interesting. So Raul has uh, has started, had a special of cigars, I mentioned this last week, that are black-owned brands that I thought were interesting, because a lot of them I'd never heard of, and most of them I've never tried before. I think I tried one of them. I don't really recall which one. But so for the next uh, coming week, starting on April 8th, we'll be, tr- we'll be doing the Drunk Chicken Original Gordo, in the week after that, we're going to be going moving on to the Tres Lindas Cubanas La Bolata Toro. Then the Black Star Line War Witch Robusto. Then the Carolina Blue Maduro Toro. 
And then finally, when we start into May, we're going to be doing the Emperor's Cut Grand Robusta. Now, that's probably going to change a little bit. I'm not. I'm going to try to target maybe April 29th or May 6th to bring Michael King on to do the, uh, the Agonorsa Leaf thing. So um, that's going to be coming up. So we're going to push that somewhere in that lineup. So that's going to be the next month or so worth of cigars. So if you get that, um, Raul is selling a, a pack of those cigars for uh, 60 bucks, I think, for the, the five. I think they're worthwhile to check out. It's, it's a nice way to, I think it'd be a nice way to try something out of the box. Now, at Tobacco Leaf, they're actually selling those cigars as a pack, and people are voting on them as to which one they like, because the one that is the, ooh, the guest favorite, they're actually going to start bringing in their, their uh, as part of their lineup at Tobacco Leaf, so that should be quite interesting. And I'm understanding that was something that Cirillo was pushing on a lot. Like, you might have seen Cirillo McLean, he came on the show a couple months back, and he's trying to push together for that, that kind of recognition, and I think that's important to try. And now it's really starting to get hot sharp, bitter. I think that signals towards the end of, the, of our cigar tonight. It's a little bit of a shame. I, would, I wish it was like that kind of thing that you really just want to smoke all the way down till your fingers are burning, but I think it's really reaching the point where it's like not as, as pleasant. <laughs> so I guess we'll cut it off there. Thank you very much again for coming in every week. Really appreciate you spending the time with me. We're back again next week, April 1st. On Thursday, 8 p.m., we'll be smoking something out of the ordinary. Yeah, I guess that's good. So let me turn on the music again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, thanks, Rusty, for coming in. Appreciate you. Tony and Ting. Die. Thanks for tuning in, everyone out there. Have a great week. Have a great week. Enjoy the smokes, and uh, you know, I guess we'll uh, see you next week. Oh, wait. Tony says the Anaparaka rapper. Oh, that's nice. That is always a nice one. All right. Have a great week, guys. See you next time. Is this working?